All right. Scapular fractures can be really, really subtle. And when you see a lucency like this, you know, it doesn't necessarily run out a cortical surface where you can see a nice break in the thin pencil line that should always be the cortex of a bone. So these can be particularly uh, tough. In fact, this one got, we give a great call of the month award to radiologists and they can all uh, submit uh, reads that they have found that other people have done. And uh, this one actually won a great call of the month award. But you can see it does go out the cortex, but not in such a way uh, as you could really see a step off. So there are just these lucencies, and there are several of them, right? Probably more than you can count, but still pretty subtle. All right. Uh, this is a glenoid fracture, and it's a pretty subtle one. Right? So you can actually see there's a step off here. Right? It looks almost like there are two glenoid surfaces, and you can see a little redundancy here. This is basically just an impaction fracture of the glenoid, and it's been pressed in, and that's why you can see that overlap here inferiorly and medially. So glenoid as well as scapular fractures can be pretty subtle. That should have won a great call as well. All right, just for completeness sake, not subtle, right? A comminuted fracture of the glenoid. That one, my mom, the English teacher could probably have spotted. This is an extremely unusual case. And actually, I remember the radiologist called me. I happened to be on at the same time. And he said, I think that's a coracoid fracture. And I said, man, I don't know. It looks like the coracoid's fine. Um, I tried to talk him out of it. And he said, well, what else is that then? It's clearly not normal. And I said, man, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it is coracoid, but I don't see how the coracoid looks as normal as this. If that's a, fra a fragment that large of the coracoid has been ripped free and displaced. And of course, remember, that's the short head of the biceps that is originating there. And it turned out he was right. Uh, he said he called it in and they also didn't believe him. It's a fairly unusual fracture to have a coracoid fracture. So they got a CT and you can see the coracoid is just truncated. It's like someone cut it right off. And there is that displaced piece of coracoid right there in the anterior brachium. So it is, in fact, a coracoid fracture. There's just uh, apparently just enough residual coracoid here to have a fairly normal appearance, although it doesn't uh, point down quite as much as a normal one might. There is, incidentally, a growth plate at the base of the coracoid. So when you look at pediatric uh, CT scans, I always remember that uh, one of our first years came in and he looked at a chest CT on a trauma on a 13, 14-year-old kid, and he gave him bilateral fractures at the base of the coracoid process because he didn't know there was a growth plate there. Uh, bilateral coracoid fractures. And I remember laughing when I read his report the next day, and I said, oh, God, I got to call somebody. Uh, and then I picked up the next chest CT, and it also happened to be a trauma on a teenager, and he had done the same thing. So not only did he believe it was possible to get bilateral coracoid fractures in the same patient, uh, but he thought it was a common enough thing that he would call it on two consecutive uh, CT scans. All right, this is one of my favorites. This has uh, all the elements that make uh, the internist in me uh, quake with anticipation. This is uh, truly a great, great film. So the distal clavicle is a lot like the sacroiliac joints, right? In that there is a differential when you see abnormalities, especially erosions or resorption of the distal clavicle. Uh, you think inflammatory processes, rheumatoid arthritis in the 
uh, distal clavicle, which is not so much on your list on sacroiliac joints. But all the other inflammatory processes that can give you sacroiliitis can also erode the distal clavicle. But uh, to the sacroiliac differential, uh, which includes things like renal osteodystrophy, right, psoriatic arthritis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis not so commonly uh, will affect the distal clavicle. Uh, but to those, you also want to add rheumatoid arthritis, which has a particular predilection for distal clavicular erosion, and also traumatic osteolysis, sometimes occupational, uh, most likely due to weightlifting. Repetitive weightlifting uh, can cause resorption of the distal clavicle. As well as, of course, like I said, the sacroiliac differential, particularly renal osteodystrophy or hyperparathyroidism. But something that people do not often know about renal osteodystrophy or hyperparathyroidism is that it will also cause resorption at the coracoclavicular insertion of the clavicle. Right there, look at how there is no cortex here, right? It's all been resorbed and it's really irregular in appearance. That's coracoclavicular ligament resorption. And that's really specific for renal osteodystrophy or hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism. And this patient has what is most likely a three-part, you can see there's one part, two parts, and then the shaft makes up the third, a three-part humeral head fracture. Uh, this was with minimal trauma. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting here is there's definitely uh, a malalignment of the humeral head with the glenoid and the humeral head is significantly inferiorly displaced. And that suggests the presence of a hemarthrosis, the source of which is hardly a mystery, right? But this came in with minimal trauma, just a bump against the wall. And to have that degree of fracturing of your humeral head with a big hemarthrosis is pretty unusual in a normal bone. And then I, this is from my private practice days. Then I spotted this and said, oof, this is a renal failure patient. And they said, no, she's not. Uh, so we ended up, I convinced them to get a parathyroid level and it was 450 when the normals were in the uh, tens, you know, 40 to 60 kind of range. And uh, they ended up ultimately finding a uh, parathyroid adenoma that was hyperfunctioning. So pretty cool case. Three-part humeral head fracture, inferior displacement of the humeral head, denoting a hemarthrosis, and that coracoclavicular resorption suggesting a parathyroid abnormality, right? You can see how that cortex ends here and here, and you've got this divot right there. All right, this is not subtle but it's an elbow dislocation. You can see they usually go together. Uh, the ulna is posteriorly displaced. You can see the olecranon fossa not occupied by the trochlea. And of course the radial head has gone with it. Uh, these can be difficult to relocate. And I'll, I'll tell you my ER story, which is hilarious. I was absolutely the worst at relocating dislocated joints, right? I was an internist who was working as an ER guy. And, uh, you know, I had not had a lot of procedural training. I was pretty good at stitching. I could intubate. Uh, I was pretty good at central venous catheters. But when it came to relocating dislocated joints, I had no training whatsoever. And so I had, I stumbled upon this book on a bookshelf in our ER, uh, Management of Orthopedic Injuries. And I saw this, uh, this elbow dislocation come in and I said, I can't do it. I've never done this before. So I went and I got the book and it was really a nice book. It gave you step-by-step -step instructions, you know, place the patient slightly on their left side, you know, inject lidocaine in the antecubital fossa, grasp the olecranon process and pull down and forward. And so I'm reading all this as I'm looking down at the patient, and he was a pretty big young guy, and he looked up at me and he said, whoa, you're reading a book? And I said, 
yeah, I, I can put it away if you prefer. And he chose to let me uh, continue my perusal of said textbook. It actually went well. It popped back in uh, with such a resounding click that his eyes widened and he punched me. So he was taken aback. Uh, but anyway, getting the uh, coronoid process to clear the trochlea is the whole challenge in relocating these things. All right, this is an olecranon fracture. It is an unusual fracture. It definitely happens, and I've seen plenty of them at this point where there was no underlying problem, but just a little warning. When you see an olecranon fracture, start really looking at the bones and saying, is there something going on here, right? Is there a congenital abnormality? I've got a great case of this in a PEDS uh, case where it was osteogenesis imperfecta. But it, the olecranon fracture is unusual enough that I start thinking maybe there's an underlying abnormality. So that was not the case here. Uh, but again, it's a warning I'll give you to, to really look at those bones and say, are these normal? Because that is uh, fairly unusual. You can see the fracture goes right through the olecranon right here. And this is a great example of a very nice lateral film that shows you the manifestations of hemarthrosis. Okay, so see the anterior fat pad here is lifted out. And this is what they call the sail sign. So that triangular appearance where it's anteriorly elevated, right, is the fat pad sign. And similarly, the posterior fat pad, you can see just a hint of its lucency right here, right? And the posterior fat pad of the elbow should never be visible. The anterior fat pad will be visible, but it will lie flush against the anterior aspect of the humerus, right? And not be lifted out like it is here, right? You see that ramp right there? And then a little bulge underneath, which is the hemarthrosis pushing it up, right? But the, so the anterior is typically visible on a true lateral, but it's right up against the anterior humerus, whereas you should never see the posterior fat pad in a normal film. And those are important findings because we'll be talking about this. A lot of other elbow fractures can be really subtle, and that can be the only finding you see. All right, so there are the olecranon. You can see on the frontal, this is the olecranon right up here. And it's sitting over uh, the olecranon fossa of the distal humerus. Right, but that's it right there. Okay, and speaking of the super subtle fractures of the elbow, in adults, it's going to be a radial head fracture. If you see no apparent fracture and yet a large hemarthrosis, and this is a beautiful example of sail sign. See that anterior fat pad is sticking way out and it looks like a sail, right, instead of being flush along the anterior aspect of the humerus. And we've got a huge post posterior fat pad here which again should normally never be visible. Uh, a caveat to that is that's on a proper, true lateral film. So every once in a while you might spot a posterior fat pad and think, oh, oh, it's a hemarthrosis. Look carefully and make sure it's a true lateral because if they oblique the distal humerus at all, it'll start to reveal that posterior fat pad and it can be normal in that circumstance. All right, so this is a radial head fracture and there's just a tiny little step off. You might not even call that, but you've got this huge hemarthrosis. And in an adult, you're gonna call a hemarthrosis a suspected radial head fracture. Uh, in children, of course, it means it's a supracondylar fracture and we'll be getting to that in later lectures. All right, so that's a radial head fracture. This probably is the fracture but it's uh, it's pretty tough to call. And anatomically, right, there's a little collar to the radial head, uh, so it can be tough to identify fractures. So here's a better one where you can actually see the fracture right there in the radial head. And again, you've got the anterior fat pad sticking way out, 
clear sail sign and a big prominent posterior fat pad as well. All right, one more. I really like this one because you can see the radial head fracture. Yeah, it's a, there's often a little step off here, but this is too abrupt. And if you sit back and let your eyes glaze a little, you actually can pick up the trabecular disorganization, right? The trabeculi are not going across as proper lines. You can see there's a actual disruption running right through them right there. All right, and again, big anterior fat pad, big prominent posterior fat pad as well. So that's another radial head fracture. Look at that, trabecular disorganization right through there.